All right, well, again, welcome to the final class of Biblical Womanhood. Um, so in this whole thing, what we've tried to do is view biblical womanhood with the purpose of and response to with this. If you can just get in your mind, the Lord says, obviously, we're all women in here, okay? We all love Jesus. So what we want to do is be a biblical woman. And so it's saying to the Lord, yes, Lord, whatever that is, whatever that looks like, that's what I want to be. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship. Remember, it's the word that we spoke, we spoke a little bit about it last week. It's We're his poem. That's where we get the word uh, poem here in the English language. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So he's written out our lives with a purpose to do something good. And then it goes on, which God prepared beforehand. He's figured out what is it that I'm going to use in your life to bring me glory and then it finishes up that verse that we should walk in them. So this verse specifically and precisely clarifies that God has a design purpose for our lives. And he didn't just randomly go, well, let's just split it up. I'm going to make 50% men, 50% women. No, he said, here's what I want my image to look like in the life of womanhood, in the life of a woman, but very specifically in the life of Tanya and Rachel, and Faith, and you can just go around the room. What does that look like when I image Christ in my life? So what we're going to do is figure out what are, what are the blueprints? What is the blueprint that the Lord has put on us that he wants to showcase this workmanship? That he wants to say, this is, I'm writing out who I am, and I'm writing out in beautiful poetry how majestic I am, how loving I am, how grace-filled I am, how powerful I am, how strong I am. Whatever it is, he's writing that with my life and with your life. And we have to figure out how it is, that, what that looks like, and then, like it says there in Ephesians, and walk in those things. Figure out how it is. So what are some of the targets that we can sh shoot for? What are some things that we can be um, strategically aiming for in our life, especially as a woman? Number one. Aim to be fruitful. Now, th this gets tricky as we say this because when you think about fruitfulness, you're thinking about offspring, and certainly that's true. Every normal woman is, is equipped to be a mother, but certainly not every woman in the world is destined to make use of her biological equipment for birthing. But there is still motherhood is, is even deeper than that. It's, it's the essence of womanhood. Remember when you know, he, he names her woman in creation. Then after the fall, he, he names her and he calls her Eve. And, he, and that, le, that name actually means life giver. Life giver is mothering. If you give life to something, you become a mother of something. So God's purpose for every woman, whether you're um, married, single, biological birthing or not, is to bring forth life into situations, to bring forth life into the circle of influence that you have. So regardless of your age or stage or occupation or, you know, if I'm past childbearing age, it doesn't mean my womanhood is done with, right? I still have the responsibility for a fruitfulness, life-bearing uh, situations and opportunities around me. So I have to figure out how it is that I'm going to do that. Our goal is to figure out how we aim to be fruitful. So when we look at Paul's letter that he's written to Timothy, and he gets um, what he's doing is in this letter he's trying to identify. There was a problem where there were a lot of widows in uh, this early church, and some of them were not true widows, and so he's giving out in, in Timothy, he's given this, the qualifications of what you're going to look for. I hate to use the word worthy widows, but w widows who truly were in need and how to provide for them. And so he gives out these guidelines, and some of them are as general as you have to identify who truly is a widow because they got so zealous in the early church, which, just, which isn't a bad thing, to care for the, um, what they thought were destitute women, because remember in early biblical times, if you were a woman and you lost your husband, then you lost your livelihood. Or if you were a widow, someone who wasn't married, then it, it was a problem in that world. That was a problem in that culture. They had not embraced um, 
how to help women do what women were really equipped to do. So he says, let's identify who really are widows in this group. But then he gets more specific, and he looks at the life of the widow. Basically what they do then is they say, well, let's look at the, at the widows and of, basically just look at her testimony of how she has lived. And if she has lived, in, in, and they name off specific ways, it, it, she has invested her life for kingdom good, we want to see um, her cared for in the way because she's lived faithfully in a way that deserves to be honored. So we want to honor her by caring for her. And one of the ways that they do that is they look at her life and it says, um, like one of them was having brought up children. We go back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10. It says, having a reputation for good works. That's one of the, hey, by the way, look back there. That's Garrett. All right, that's who it is. I told him you'll be teaching. <laughs> so I, I tried to describe you. So he comes in the back of the room, but nobody ever looks back. So now that's him. All right, so you'll see him around there. That's Elisa's husband. But anyway, so it talks about them having a reputation for good works. Isn't that what it just said back in Ephesians when we were talking about that there were good works prepared by God in advance for them to do that so that they would walk in them? Basically, what Paul's saying is we need to look for those women who did that very thing, and then we need to honor them by caring for them in the way that they need care. And one of the qualifications that they're looking for when it gets more specific is if she has brought up children, that, meaning if she has invested in the lives of other people, especially, and it means specifically children in this, from the beginning, it was God's plan. We all have to acknowledge this, that to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But he, he didn't want women to just simply bear children for the sake of in, increasing the human population. It wasn't that we were just populating ovens, it, that we were actually to bear it with a godly seed. We were supposed to reproduce offspring that would make Christ's name known would would point to God would point to the family of God and advance it in ways we're supposed to bring forth children early in as we read in Genesis back there we're supposed to bring forth children but not just bring them forth by birthing them but actually nurturing them to know Christ to know God to to look at God and so God blesses women with a child so that she may expand his kingdom but in this context, what we need to understand is that motherhood is cr a crucial part of God's redemptive plan because it's critical in the life of a woman and specifically of a mother to preserve truth for the next generation. Obviously, you have a circle. If you're a mom and in your home, you have a circle, a, a tight circle of influence, right? As you you have the opportunity to influence those children in great ways for Christ. And you've got to figure out from early on that you're doing that. I think we, we understand and we hope and want the Holy Spirit to get our children and, and use them for kingdom's sake. But I think sometimes I've noticed that we, you know, it's not to say we should not train our children in academics and teach them you know, how to count and how to color. But is it, isn't it strange that Early on, and you'll notice this typically happens, is what we spend a lot of time doing is teaching our children to identify um, intellectual things. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to teach my child to know these presidents or to know uh, their color. I mean, we're, we begin by doing that. I'm not saying that teaching your children uh, color isn't a good thing, but you've, we've got to know as Christians, we're responsible to make sure Christ is preeminent over everything else, that God matters and that teaching God matters from the very beginning. It, it is a, uh, you know, I have, to, I have to talk about your little girl just a little bit. I saw a video, um, I guess was it Seth reading a children's Bible storybook to her? I, want, I hope I'm quoting her correctly. But he said, she pulls this book up, and she's, Delaney's just a doll. Anyway, so she's reading, and she's genius, by the way. <laughs> but she is, scares me, scares me a little bit, intimidates me fiercely. But, yeah, I show Harper, I go, Harper, what is the deal here? <laughs> Harper bicks her nose, and Delaney's talking about theology. <laughs> but, anyway, she, she'll hold this book up, and, and she was talking, and her daddy asked her, what is that book? And she 
Yeah. 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 How old's Delaney, by the way? Okay. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it's sweet. Like it's, one time, I was seeing her get in the uh, her automobile, and I go over to her and I'd heard her sing uh, "Jesus Loves Me" song or something like that. And I said, "Hey, well, you sing, boy." She pops that past fire out, and she just belting out, "Yes, Jesus <laughs> loves me," and then puts it back in. Okay, back to life. <laughs> but you understand the responsibility and privilege of teaching that. Also, I will say the responsibility that our young kids workers have over there they don't just babysit our children here they work hard to pour into our kids um, knowledge of God from early on and so as a as a mom who has children in her home it is our responsibility to teach start teaching redemptive truths to our children at a very early age you can do that with colors by the way you can, you can show, like you can say, you can teach them both things at the same time, but we can't say, I want to train my child to be a brilliant intellectual and forsake training them in the good godly disciplines that they, they actually have. So it's critical to do that. But here's the two ditches that we can sort of fall off uh, the track on, the, the road on and get in uh, concerning motherhood. First one is having a dismissiveness about it. You know, I, I will talk to people and every once in a while and I'll say, you know, like they will say, I don't want to have uh, children because they will interfere with my life. They're too complicated. It's too much drama, da, da, da. They see it. It's not that they can't. Uh, it's not that the Lord hasn't designed their life to have children. In it. It's that they have designed their life to not have children in it because they think that what that would bring. So they devalue. You know, you saw, um, I'm thinking, I can't remember exactly. Dr. Muller was, um, he's, he did a podcast recently. And I think he said in 18 years um, that the, the population for colleges will so drastically drop that it may be hard to, to uh, function. And, I, and why that is, is because there's a whole band of people who stopped childbearing. And they pursued other things and just said, you know, I'd rather do this and then put off later I will have children in my 40s or something. And, you know, I don't know how else to say this. I don't want to be unkind, but I think our culture has told them you can have, they've told women you can do it all. You can do everything you want first and then later do, um, you can have your family. And I'm just telling you, that's just not true. <laughs> you can't have it all. You, and you have to figure out what are the best seasons for things to happen. Um, you know, like if you're waiting in your late 40s, like, you know, and Hollywood does this, don't they? Hollywood does that. Like they'll say, you know, I want to have a child. Well, you know, the likelihood of, of your reproductive years being better in 40 is false. There's just no way that statistics prove that out. But they just go, yeah, but we have other means and measures to make that happen. It's still hard, you all. It's, it's still difficult, and so, you know, there's been a devaluing of that. So we need to see that the value of, of having a child is a gift from God. It's not a, a horrible uh, albatross around your neck. It's something that the Lord has been precious in gifting to women. I, we've got a waitress that we're working with and working on and loving uh, as best we can. Uh, she's a single mom. And we've been, you know, speaking to her a lot, and she's become a very, very dear friend of ours. Anyway, long story short, she has a little boy, and he's 18 months old. And then um, we will go into the restaurant to visit her, and she sits down at the seat beside us, and she says, I've got to talk to you all about something. It's been so, you know, she was, you just tell she was so anxious and so nervous and everything. She said, well, I'm pregnant. And she said, um, I'm scared. I was, I've been so scared to tell you. And we go, no, no. You know, God is the giver of life. However this baby got here, whatever has happened in your life to bring this child into your life, God is not surprised by that. And, I, and we started to celebrate her life. I'm going to tell you, you should have just watched her countenance grow. And she said, I've been so ashamed and thought you all would 
because you know that what, I, what I've done is not a good thing and a right thing. I thought how you all might push me away. And I was like, oh, man, that made my heart hurt. Because what that says is she thinks that Christians don't value life over, you know, that she sees that we, we, we look at sin more critically and more heavily than we value and weigh out life. And it's like, no, we, you know, we're, we know this isn't, this isn't probably your desire and what you're designing, but it is God's design, and he's gifted you with something in the midst of something like this. And so she said, well, will you all just help me do this well? I'm thinking, man, do you see how the Lord just is opening up her sweet little heart and, and life to us? The second ditch, while marriage normally results in giving birth to biological children, it is not always the case, nor is it the ultimate goal. Woman's ultimate aim is to be spiritually fruitful, to bear and raise spiritual fruit. We, we have, I don't care who you are, age or stage, if it were all about just bearing children, like I said, my work's done, right? Because I'm past childbearing age. No, God's ultimate goal for womanhood, hey, Alice, God's ultimate goal for womanhood is that we bear spiritual fruit all the days of our life. We, we birth new believers. We birth little children we, who, and help them know who Christ is. It's a given that all women are to be spiritually fruitful, single, childless, women past childbearing age. We are all to have a household of faith. Listen to this. this is, God's purpose is to give reproductive fruit in our household. And the psalmist speaks to a barren woman, and listen what he, what he says. He gives, a, I'm using a different version than the ESV. I'm using the Holman Christian Standard Bible and also the New Living Translation in this because I think they do a better job of saying it just plainly and clearly. He, oh, excuse me, 113.9, Psalm 113.9. It says, he gives the childless woman a household, making her the joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. Do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying that God's got a purpose, even for the childless woman, to reproduce in her household uh, heirs, um, spiritual heirs for him. New Living Translation. He gives the childless woman a family, making her a happy what? Mother. You see that? So how a childless woman all, can produce children. Isn't that what that verse is saying there and isn't that what he's alluding to so when God uh, raised up and gave Israel the fourth judge of Deborah we we can see that in her it makes no mention of her having children we know that she's married but listen to how she describes herself she didn't describe herself first as a ruler though she was one or judge or a prophet or a leader but she says in Judges 5 verse 7 she has given uh, she it, it says that villagers ceased in Israel they ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. You see how she said, life, she, she saw that her purpose was life-giving, that she was supposed to be protective and nurturing and use the instincts of womanhood, the courage and compassion. Again, think still magnolia, where both those things come into play, where there's a softness and a, and a very strong way about her and she used her position to influence what we look back there in Ephesians at the very first text I gave her good works she used who she was who God had created her to be to show himself in walking out her good works later and this this one just really blew me away how God uses um, womanhood especially the mothering technique um, when Paul is talking about giving greetings to different people in Romans, he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Now, can you imagine that Paul, the great apostle Paul, who probably had, aside from Christ, more influence on the gospel being spread and you know like imagine like isn't it neat just somebody going you're just like a mom to me doesn't that feel good for somebody to say something unless you're real young and they're old and they say, <laughs> and say <laughs> you don't want that but you know like if somebody says to me man you you're just like I love you just like my own mother 
You're, you're, like, you're just like a mom to me. And when there are people who God has entrusted in my world who are like sons to me that didn't, they didn't even come across our path. Herschel, I mean, through, the, through our children, they came across our path through some other scenario. There's, there's a few pastors out there across uh, the U.S. who when I see uh, something about them and I hear about their faithful testimony and how just awesome they are, like Adam Dooley's one of them. He's like a son of the faith to us. Uh, you know, like, and you know, like he doesn't ever call me mom because I would slap him because we're too close in age, but I do feel mother-like to him. Does that make sense? So when I, see, when I saw him walk the journey he did with his son with leukemia, and just the testimony of his trust and faith in Christ, to be connected, to have any influence his life, in his life for spiritual good, is, I, I just can't put a price on that. That just blesses me more than I can tell you. And so can you imagine having Paul, the Christ-loving Paul, somebody, Paul say to somebody else, hey, tell Tanya uh, hello for me as well. Man, she is just like a mother to me. She, she mothered me just like she did her own. Wouldn't that be awesome to know that you had that kind of impact and um, character in it? I, you know, even though you're not, you can't help but take note of, you never hear mention of Paul's biological mother, do you? The whole, you don't know anything about her, but you know about this woman who's not even birth-related to him. She just had this incredible impact. Now, do you understand what kind of impact you can have in the lives of men and young men and women that the Lord has put in your household of faith, your circle of faith? Um, we see this in the, the dynam, dynamic way that the, the lady's mother are single moms. Judy, when I walk past that room on uh, Wednesday night and I see those moms in there, and is Tina in here this morning? All right, well, let me tell you, Tina went uh, to school, went back to school. She's a single mom, and she got her degree in, what was it? Do you remember? What is it? Shut up, is it? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so there, there we go. If culinary was not your thing up here, we need to get Tina to come and do something for us, maybe. Um, but uh, I remembered seeing she was about to graduate or something, and then I saw her graduation pictures, and... Uh, all those who had mothered her and shepherded her heart through this program, they were there to cheer her on like a mom would to watch their child graduate. Do you know how, what a blessing that is to see women using, you know, she, Judy has no blood relation to Tina, but you get to see the fruitfulness that that is a fruitful offspring of investing in, in the life of those women. You all, we can't lose sight of watching those things happen. The nursery workers, you know, the ones who mother our children over there, they hold them up close. Do you know how, you know, it's sweet to me, I'll go over there and I'll see there are certain women who just do well laying babies on their chest. <laughs> I don't know. Have you all noticed they just do it well? It's like, you know, the baby just nuzzles in there just right. Do you know how many dendrites and everything they're feeding in that little kid's body at that moment, that loving on them? It's feeding their capability of, of mental intellect and all that rubbing that they do on them. You know, when your baby comes back from the nursery and they smell of perfume, that means they have been mothered. That's what that means. It means somebody has mothered those little ones and loved on them. And, you know, when they come back with uh, Wednesday night, uh, Tammy Brown gave out horns uh, to the kids. I don't know if it was part of the lesson or they were just on clearance and she thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I watched uh, the littles coming down the hall here blowing these horns, and I watched the moms going, those are going in the garbage as soon as we get home. <laughs> and I... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that stays in the car. But it's funny, I told Elizabeth, Chris, and Hannah's little girl, as she was walking by, and she was blowing her horn, just burr, burr, real loud. I said, tonight, when you can't get anybody's attention, reach over beside your bed and go, burr. <laughs> but they will. No, no, they don't know that, except for in the, unless they watch this, of course. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I, I see it in the people who say, I want, to, I want to connect up in a way that I'm influential in this little kid's life, that I 
you know, it was sweet to me. I love going back to that nursery and watching little kids um, delight to run to somebody from their own parent. What that says is that person has built into them this mothering, nurturing, connecting thing. We have to make sure that we value it. I see it, it or I don't know if um, Vaughn, uh, I've drawn a blank on uh, David and Irene. Irene, Irene sorry. Uh, they have done that with non-biological grandchildren and children. You know, the two children that she has here, you would never know those are not her grandchildren. She grandchildren's as well, almost as well as I do. <laughs> no, she's, they're magnificent. They have mothered people that they have no, no blood relation to any of that circle of people, but they have just taken that, you know, uh, those grandchildren, the mom of those children into their heart and their lives, and they've gone through not just giving them Christmas presents for Christmas. I mean, they invest their life. They nurture, they love on, they draw them close and do it. I see Rachel and Kathy Hayner and Jennifer going on mission trips and loving on those, you know, there's nothing sweeter to me. And I'll tell you, it's nothing sweeter to you all because I see pictures of you all sitting with little kids in your lap all scooched up with them. You know, they haven't had the privilege of nurtured, mothering love and hugs. And let's say you get 10 days or one week or whatever, they are, they are getting something fed into their system that God designed for them to have that if you weren't there doing it, they wouldn't have gotten, right? And so the fact that you pull them in, I, I love it. It's like even after you've been gone for them a while, they were part of your life, aren't they? Like I'll see Jennifer repost, like it comes up, uh, you know, periodically. There are a couple of little, little kids in her life that are special to her, that her heart got knit with them and mothering and nurturing. You know, you can't miss those opportunities to, to do that. Biblical womanhood integrates that life-giving, um, eving, you know, mothering technique into them because God has fashioned and equipped us to be mothering to bring forth godly offspring, to love on them and to fill the voids of that affection and nurturing. Because, you know, I, the difference between a way a man loves on a child and a woman loves on a child are very, very different. I, I, you can see it very early on. I've used it before. You hand a man a, a child who's like one-year-old to one-and-a-half-year-old to take care of them. And you know what they do? They balance them on their hands. <laughs> you ever see a man do that? Like they'll take, I, it's rare you ever see a woman get a child and they go, I'm going to balance this baby on my hand. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. What's a woman do? Pulls them in close. Smells them. Don't, you know, rubs them. They do that. A man, just watch a man do it. Yeah, that's right. You automatically, like, and even after you're not holding them, you'll sway. <laughs> yeah, somebody says it. So, yeah, there's just something different. Like, they'll joke, men joke, poke, do all this, which is very appropriate. You know, wrestle. You know, it, it's funny, you know, because uh, I remember we had, yeah, put some, uh, they put them on their shoulder. They do all this. It's all about lifting, throwing down, <laughs> rolling around. <laughs> it, that's good, though. That's God's design as well. But women, it's not to say we can't do all those boyhood wrestling. I still wrestled with the boys, but there was a time I go, stop wrestling me. I'm too old to be wrestling with y'all now. <laughs> you know, and the, the man can keep doing that and do that. It gets weird if a woman keeps doing it, doesn't it? There comes a time where you go, no, you treat me like a female treats me. We had our nephew move into us, and he was in his 20s or something, and he would come home every day and wrestle me. Wrestle me down to the ground. I'm not kidding. Am I kidding, Faith? Golly. And so I, I remember I told Herschel, I said, you got to tell him, quit wrestling me. <laughs> He's, I'm moving him out if he doesn't stop wrestling me. If he wrestles me, won't you tell him if he wrestles me one more time, he's out of here. And he'd lived with us maybe this time seven months or something. He came home one day. Herschel had already told him, don't wrestle Tanya. She didn't want you wrestling her anymore. If you pin her down to the ground one more time, you're out of here. Well, I'm t wrestled me like a daggone wrestling match or something. So he came in one day, picked me up, wrestled me down. I said, you're out of here, dude. 
You're out, yeah, I told you if you wrestle me one more time, you were warned you're doing it. I called her to live on the phone. I literally did. I said, I don't care where you are and what you're doing. You're on your way home, and you're taking your nephew. He's wrestled me today. <laughs> wrestled me to the mat, and he's out of here. He's done. I'm uncle, whatever it is, I'm crying, I'm crying, it, and I'm, I'll be in the parking lot up at uh, up the road, and you can call me when he's gone. <laughs> And Herschel did, by the way. <laughs> because I'm telling you, there's something that you've got to establish. Here's what females are. Here's what males are. And you have to help them know those things. Colossians 1.10, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of your Lord. So ask, ask yourself, what opportunities has God placed in your current situation to bear the kind of fruit where you are mothering spiritual fruit or mothering in general, whatever? Which ones are you unyielding to that God has sent you? Number two, we can strategically aim to be welcoming. One of the most beautiful purpose of womanhood is she creates and, wel- and manages a welcoming, and I'm careful to use this, but I really believe this, a, a home. It's not that God has a checklist of what chores that she must do or who must do them exclusively, but God does say that we are to manage our house. We are to be, uh, that my home, it's not saying that my home is all my focus and you know, because God, let's just be honest, God is not impressed with any of our designer skills. You know, we're not going to get there and he'll go, wow, the way you could match those palettes in your home and make it all feng shui. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because he, he, you understand what he's got that he has created in heaven. So my skill set of designering is not impressive to God at all. What he has placed on is the high value I place in managing and, and loving my home and nurturing the things in my home. Proverbs 31, 27 says, She looks well to the ways of her household, and she does not eat the bread of idleness. Basically, she sets a watch on her home and pays attention to the comings and goings of it and to the things that need addressing in that home the things that need to be done. And it says she doesn't eat the bread of idleness, meaning she's not a sloth and slow to take care of it. She's not lazy in the home. You know, she makes whatever needs to happen in her home happen. You know, whatever kind of home you live in, being domestic in your home is a skill set that if you have not acquired, you have to train yourself into. You know, it may not come naturally to a lot of us, and maybe you didn't get that training when you were young, but you know, we can't look at that as something as demeaning or that's not my skill set or that's just not my responsibility, it's not my gifting, whatever it is. I have to throw out that view because being um, into my home basically just means I have a heart for the use of my home. I have a heart for the way my home gets used for his kingdom good. You all cannot deny that there are some things that happen in a home and connections that can happen at a home that will not happen in a Starbucks. There are things you could do in a home that, you know, that somebody's not going to get when, you, when they stay in a hotel. And in our world, we have, we have looked at hospitality and defined it in false ways, in unbiblical ways. We've let Martha Stewart basically decide what... Um, hospitality looks like and let's just be honest she stinks at it what she does do is decorate well but how she defines hospitality is not how God defines hospitality well have you ever seen her like for instance let's just look at this if she has somebody come to her house for dinner she's probably going to stuff a bird with herbs that she's grown out in her yard and then she's going to lace it all fine and it's going to be magnificently displayed but next door neighbor, she has built a fence between the two of them, and they've had, like, lawsuit going between them because the two of them fight. She can't even get along with her next-door neighbor at all. So I'm going, if you can't get along with your next-door neighbor, but you can set a banquet before people, something's wrong there, isn't it? Do you see the disconnect? Industry instead of That's right. That's right. It's a in- industry. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I, I will never forget. Herschel, one time he had called me and said, you know, I want, 
we've got some friends that, uh, you know, that I want to come over to the house, and he's going to stay the night with us. And, you know, it's like, I'm sure, and I didn't think to ask, but later as I find out, he's a multimillionaire, and he's coming to our house. It's when we lived in Louisville, and I just remembered, oh, my word, a multimillionaire is coming to our house. Can we add a new bathroom? <laughs> because the one I have is not good. And I started thinking all this, and, you know, and anyway, he ends up coming to the house. There was something that I forgot. I said, I'm going to run out to the grocery store. Hersh, I'll be right back. We had a couch that we had for 14 years that we bought for $50 at a yard sale. And it's the kind that you sit down and your knees come up to your chest. So <laughs> that was what we had. But I remember coming in, and Bert is sitting at, instead of I'm at my dinner table where I've got set and everything, Herschel thought, well, I'll just go ahead and start while Tanya's not here. And he got him a TV tray, <laughs> set him down in the living room or in the den on that couch where his knees are up in his chest and they were eating off Ronald McDonald plates. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not, I about had a heart attack. I'll never forget walking in there and go, hey, babe, can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> If you lost your mind, I had the table set in there, and I did all that stuff and everything. And, and he said, well, I asked him, are you okay just sitting here in front of the TV and watching the game, and I'll get you a TV tray? And I said, and set a, a couch with his knees up at his chin. Did you throw that part in? <laughs> Eat on Ma Ronald McDonald's place. He goes, really, chill. We're okay. We're fine. And you know what? He is a dear, dear friend of ours, and he, would, he felt loved and normal and everything, you know, don't think your home has to be certain things. You know, uh, what we are wanting is to create a sense of belonging. And uh, fancy plates don't do that, by the way. You know that? Fancy plates go, you're special, and I'm Lottie Daw, and I'm going to do that. <laughs> but you just say, hey, get you a plate out of the cabinet and fix that. We're ordering pizza. Make yourself at home. It's one of the greatest lines you can say to somebody. Make, your, make yourself at home. Oh, <laughs> Uh, but you know what? It, it, this, isn't, this doesn't come naturally to us because we, we'll see we have these competing interests. You know, I'm actually naturally a perfectionist pleaser personality. Basically, what underlying thing about that is is I'm prideful. That's, I'll just be honest with you. If, I, if I'm perfectionist about it and I want to please you, then at the source of that is so that you, you're impressed by my skill set and then you say so, by, that's how I know you're pleased with me. But that's just at the bottom of that. It's just plain old pride. But I'm also equally on the other end of it. I'm an accumulator, and I can be undisciplined in keeping my stuff up. So that's slothful, right? Well, because I knew you were coming. <laughs> that, that really is true, Alice. I just have to say that. But throw in the fact that I like having my privacy. Don't y'all like having your privacy? Like you bring somebody in, you know they're messing with your privacy. They're messing. You can't walk around in your jammies. You get, you know, there are certain things that you can do, but I can't let those things justify not using my home because God will use our homes in ways that He cannot use any other venue format. That I mean, it's you saying you are part of my life when somebody comes into your home. It's the sense of belonging. Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's. Do you remember what your mom had for dinner that night? No, but she remembers that the lady fell out of the chair. <laughs> Tell you, it's and it's moments, it's things like that that truly are those things that go. Hey, I'm telling you, that lightened the spirit of the home. On some level, you, you've seen those kind of things happen like that. So I will just tell you, I've used every excuse in the book to keep my comfort zone, zone of my home. What, what feels good to me? When we were in seminary, I would say, it's too small. It's just too small. I don't have enough room to put people in my house. But I remember distinctly going up into a hut in the Amazon jungle and sitting on a plank with eight people in a room that was maybe one-fourth this size. And the bathroom was outside. Actually, the bathroom was like you just leaned over a ledge. 
us really was it and feeling incredible love and connection and knowing these are people I will spend eternity with it was the family that just kept saying we we would be so honored to have you come to our house we'd be so honored we'd be so honored and we come and I remember we are all like scrunched in (laughs) at the table eating it's one of the sweetest memories I mean it's just laid on my heart as something very very special so how about we're too poor and we don't have much to share I'll never forget in seminary uh, Herschel had invited David Miller, or David Miller, who comes to speak to our house. And of course, I, automatically, I'm going through logistics of how to get a wheelchair in the house and how you do this. And we lived in a tiny 800 square foot home. And it was just, it, it just logistically, it was a, a, being a nightmare. But then also, we did not have any money. We, it was a time where the, the Lord was t- stretching us and teaching us in different ways. And I told Herschel, I said, all we've got, all we've got to give him are soup, beans, and cornbread. That's what I got. That's what we're having for supper. That's what we're doing. And uh, I remember David Miller and um, Bill Williams was with him at the time, came and stayed at our house. We sat down at the table, and I said, almost embarrassed, just so awkward feeling, just feeling humiliated. That all I had was soup, beans, and cornbread. I remember laying it before David Miller, and he goes, we going to be friends for life. I can feel it right now. <laughs> he says, this is my favorite meal. And let me just tell you, it, he became our lifelong friends. And God used David Miller to turn the heart of my son back to Christ. God trained David, uh, used David Miller to train my son to love Jesus and to be a servant. And you know, Seth York is fruit of David Miller, almost more than he's fruit of me. And if I'd missed that little opportunity to just knit our hearts together, I can't, I can't even imagine how the trajectory of my life would have changed. It, okay, how about it's not much to look at. My house is not ready. I also remember I went to Hershey's. We call them fill-in grandparents. Basically, they're not grandparents by birth, but they are grandparents by location. They happen to be close to where Herschel was living when his grandparents were not close. And they just grandparented Herschel. He'd stop by their house, and they treated him just like a grandchild, Grandma and Granddaddy Brown. And I remember the first time we got to their house, and she said, Yins, come in. Yins, come in. We sit down here at the table. Come on. We sat down at the table, and she had one of those clear tablecloths that you lay over top of the tablecloth that you're trying to save. You know kind of thing? And I remember sitting down at it, and, you know, she, it's a country home. It's just an old country home. Nothing at all amazing about it. It had a country home smell of, you know, the mothballs and country ham. <laughs> and so it was just really, but I remember sitting down at the table, and I put my arms on the, lean in, listen to her, and every time I picked my arms up, I'd pick the tablecloth up. <laughs> and I'd have to put it back down, and it had, like, sticky jam all over it. Homemade jam, I might add. And she, you know, she had set out food from that had been cooked early in the day and it set out all day long you know none of us died by the way we <laughs> ate <laughs> we ate that food and I became that day an, another grandchild and a regular at that table and it had nothing to do with anything fancy whatsoever it had everything to do with she said you belong to me now you're part of us and Yin's one of us now, is what she said as we, as we left. And, um, you know, how about my life is pretty peaceful and I like peace. <laughs> and I don't want to bring a bunch of hooligans into my house <laughs> messing it up, you know. It's like, well, if I invite them over, they got to bring their kid, you know. I'll, I'll, again, I won't forget. One time there was a group of 24 Brazilians who had come to the U.S. to tour around the U.S. And David Hatcher calls us on the phone. He said, hey, something fell through at our hotel. We're coming to your house. All 24 Brazilians. <laughs> and I was like, what am I going to do? He goes, they'll all just sleep on floor. Don't worry about it. It'll be great. <laughs> 24 of them show up. They, we, I lit, I'm calling people. You got a blanket? You got a pillow? I need all this. Anyway, were we just, no, we were in Louisville at the time. So we laid out over our floor, 24 Brazilians, and everybody stepped over everybody. And I can't tell you how many times I have thought so fondly about that event in my life. One of the, the neatest things that we did that night, they all needed their clothes washed because they had been on the road. And I remember we stood in there. They had never seen static electricity before because in Brazil, it's so humid. You don't get static there at all. And we all, all of us were standing in front of the dryer pulling clothes out and pulling them apart. And they would go, whoa, that's so cool. That's so cool. Throw it back in, start it again. It's like going, this is the cheapest entertainment in the, in the world. Yeah, I can 
Yes, 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 we did it all. We did all that, you know, like you bite the candy, the, the whole thing, you know, flip it. We, we walked around scooting, touching each other. <laughs> it was awesome. It was, it was so precious to me, you all. We cannot let what our culture has set out as hospitality rob us of being using those kinds of gifts. We have to do that. How am I displaying hospi hospitality as a woman of God? It's me saying you belong to us. It's our way to say that one day there is a heavenly home that is completely welcoming and open to you. You understand that's what welcoming somebody into your home. You're doing whatever is on in heaven, let it be so here on earth kind of things. God says, you're welcome to my home. You belong to me. This is the way you and I as women get to say, you're welcome with, to be with me. You're welcome to relate yourself to me. You belong with me. And third, we aim to be helpful. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man that he should be alone. I will make a helper suit about him. Now, here's the thing. Is sometimes we look at that, and again, I've told you, we think of helper as being a little bit demeaning. That is not at all God's design. Because remember, I showed you all how God called, um, or the Holy Spirit himself is called our helper. Actually, all three of the Godheads, the Father is our helper. Christ helps his people. The Holy Spirit is our helper. So we get to look at being a helper as a title of honor and not a demeaning thing. What I bring to the table of the men who are in my life is, uh, is a compliment to me. That I'm able to, you know, I will tell you when Herschel just says, man, you just get me so well, or you fit me so well. Or uh, one of the uh, wonderful godly men out here will say to me, man, you, have, you just are such a blessing to our church. You're a blessing to our life. You're a blessing in the life of my family. You're the blessing in the life of my wife, whatever. I, f I sh should feel great honor in the sense of being able to help people be better at that. So how... Even as a single woman, could we be helpful, married or single? Glorify God. Faith, I believe it was you who posted. Maybe two weeks ago, you were walking through our sanctuary, and there were men at church who were talking about verses of Scripture in the Bible. Am I correct? That, what was it you just said? Can you remember? It was something to the effect. That just thrilled my heart. Okay. That it, two men, iron sharpening iron. Okay, that was it. Okay, so... Here's your opportunity to say to those men, to encourage them in their godliness, to just go, man, that blesses me. Now, if two men hear somebody say to them, that was a blessing, or they read later in a post that that was a blessing, do you think those, that spurs them on to godly behavior? Yes. Absolutely. You know, when, when I see a man uh, shepherding the heart of his child well, guess what? I want to say to him, man, I, I saw what you did there. I saw how you just stuck with him, and you just, you know, even in his defiance, she's hung with him. And, you know, I honor you for that. You know, do you think he will be more apt to do it next time or not? He will. He'll go, yeah, that, I did a good thing. Um, we need to be spiritually and fruitfully multiplying. You know, I see single women engaged in helping our pastors. Uh, how our, you know, we engage um, them helping our pastors shepherd our youth, our children. You know, I love looking out there on Wednesday nights in the sanctuary, little pockets of people grouped around there, especially some of our single women who are sitting there pouring into their lives uh, and saying, you know, here's what God's word says. Here, I'm following up on that. And, uh, you know, that's an incredible blessing to me. Doing good works for the kingdom. I've seen married and single alike women do serve Frankfurt. How about the meal ministry that we had here at Buck Run? Do you know how influential cooking that meal? Was it Thursday's faith the meal was? One, one day a week, they would get a home-cooked, amazing meal. You know, these workers were living out of town, and so they were just eating at fast food restaurants when they would be here. And so I can't tell you how many times the people would say, man, that church just, they, they warmed our hearts by feeding our bellies kind of thing. And then they, that led for an opportunity for somebody. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I think. Uh-huh. Right. He does, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, he he prepared the work, the good works he prepared in advance for you to walk in. I mean, the Lord is doing that, and sometimes we're just going, yeah, um, I, you know, you you have to want to want those, you know, and be watching for those things to come. Number four, we we strategically aim to leave, the, leave a legacy. We have to leave a legacy of what biblical womanhood looks at to, for the women who follow behind us, because our world is messing up what women look like. And what girls look like. It, it is a, a crazy thing. We have to be willing to buck social norms. We have to willing be willing to not look at the term saying, man, she's so domestic as a negative thing. You know, the, the Lord that we would let the world rob us of being domestic in our home as a bad thing. You know, that we would take more to, you know, God, you have to learn to value what God values. And when he says being a worker in home, valuing your home, making your home function well is a great trait, then you have to say, well, then that's a great trait. But when the world says, what do you do? And you say something like, you know, moms will say, well, I'm a stay-at-home mom. Something in us that goes, I'm a stay-at-home mom. You, know, you can't do that. You can't let the world do that. You know, you, you are, if, if you are honoring God wherever you are, then that is a place of honor. And you, and you need to sort of own that. Does meekness get looked at from the world as a strength? No, but you know what? Meekness is valued in God's eyes. Moses is the meekest man on the face of the earth. Do you think Moses was weak? Or, he was actually very, very strong. He had to lead a million people, but it says he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Meekness is not weakness. It's strength under control. It's learning not to say. Yeah, it's learning not to say everything that you think. It's learning not to act in the ways you feel like acting. It's learning not to let the world change your behavior. But not only do we pass on the legacy of what it looks like a, a, as a woman of God to girls and women who follow us, we pass on truths of truth. We, we have to say, look, it's, I, I don't want to, to be a woman is a, is a strong thing. It's a good thing. And we face the model of our culture seeing women as shallow, devalued, not equal to man, right? And so we fought back against that. But what we fought to do then is we said, no, we're better than them. And we're not better than them. We're different than them. That's all the difference in the world. You know, we face that, we, you know, I am invincible. I am woman. I am strong. Anything you can do, I can do better. We compete against each other instead of complimenting each other. I, you know, I saw an interview of, um, the, they're like world-class speed skaters. Their last name is Bergsma, Yorit and Heather. And it's, she is a champion gold medalist or something, I believe, in the sprinting, and he's a long-distance skater. And they're married, and I remembered him. They were practicing together, and they said, well, here, let's race. And she said, I actually thought, because I'm a sprinter and we were going a short distance, I would win. And she said, I was, I was very surprised when he soundly defeated me. We, you know, the fact that you would think I could beat this man at speed skating who's got a different physiological makeup. You know, it's not a competition about what they can do and I can do better. It's what they can do better and what I can do better. That's what you need to do. How can I help you do better what you do? And how can I help the women be better at that than they do? But, you know, we're exhausting ourselves trying to prove we can outdo each other instead of just doing what we can do better. And I think that's probably, I suspect that may be the reason why we've moved into this new model of the, of the non-binary thing. We're done, we don't really want to be women. We don't want to be men. We want to be fluid and whatever we feel at the moment. This is re crazy. What's it's where you don't accept being. I'm not woman, and I'm not a man. I'm sort of in between it. Do you know that there, right now, I looked this up just to make sure it's true. Facebook has 56 options of gender you can choose from. 56. 56. And and you can change that as often as you like because tomorrow I may not feel as female today as I do tomorrow. That's because we've not allowed ourselves to understand how to be who we are, who God intended us to be, and go, you know, God's made me a woman. He's given me limitations as a woman, but he's given me a broad scope 
of life-changing things. And I'm not going to look at what I can't do and compete in things that make no sense and just be who God wants me to be. You know, the University of Tennessee in uh, 2015, because they wanted to make sure that binder, that gender binders, that people were stigmatized as women or stigmatized as men. And so they came up with new pronouns for he and she, and they replaced it. They, they started the school year. They said, all right, so when you fill out your application, for now we're going to call you Z, Zer, and Zim. You have to look this up. It's, you wouldn't believe it if I if it's really true, and so the legislators all you know the you know the whole board voted to do this, and so you had to check if you're a Z, a Zer, or a Zib. Well, how do you know what you are? You know, it's like yeah. How how do you decide that? It, it's crazy talk. And so the legislators all came up, rose up, and said, "No, but we're going back to he, she, her, him. We're we're using those." And thankfully, they did. But, you know, women have this incredible capability. You, you think of Timothy's uh, mother and grandmother, the influence that he had, how they fanned the flame of being able to um, leave a legacy. They left a legacy, and it, it's not meant, the father's name's not mentioned there, is it? It says, you know, shout out to your grandmother Eunice and Lois and the, your mom, the way they fanned the flame of faith in your life. You know, I have that potential to do that in my life. And then fifthly, we aim to make a difference. Sisterhood is a powerful thing. You saw that. If you, if you team up with somebody who says, I'm on your side, let's, let's wear womanhood well. Let's, let's, let's not push against being a woman. Let's embrace what being a woman is like. Be, be a strong woman, but don't be a nasty woman. <laughs> You know, be one who loves what God has done. And, you know, I want to encourage women to embrace God's role and just say, this is how God has shaped us and made us, and I want to wear it so beautifully that if I do this, I have greater influence than if I push against it. Do you understand that? If I look at God's word and say, here's what God says for me to do, that, you know, if I will not do what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, look at the customs and the traditions of this world and help it, you know, change my thinking, but l rather let the word of God change the way I think of you, him. And then it finishes out that verse. It says, then I will know how perfect and pleasing his will really is. You know, that's what I, if we feel unsatisfied half the time it's because we're not doing what God wants us to do. That really is just the bottom of it, line of it. You, know, you will have all the time in the world to do what God wants you to do. Everything that God wants you to do, he's given you the time to do it in and the capability to do it in. Let's just do it. Let's just do it well. Lord, we praise you and thank you for being women. Lord, help us not look at it as a constraint over our lives, even though culture has messed with it so badly and they have placed restraints on it. When you said we're equal, and they're claiming that you, you didn't create us equal. Lord, they're lying. That you, you are saying there's neither male nor female, no Greek or Jew or slave or free. Lord, you've given us an equality. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'd use the strength of womanhood to do the things that you created us to do and to delight in them. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.